Okay, uh, we're in our first day of Connecting Online for 2014. This is Nellie Deutsch. The current session is going to be with Jennifer Klein, who's going to be talking about fostering global citizenship. So we're in the United States now. We came from Ghana. Before that, we were in Brazil. Before that, we were in the Middle East, in Israel. And Jennifer is calling me. Why is Jennifer calling? Hi, Jennifer. What's going on? Um, can we have a chat instead? Because uh, I'm in a... Can we chat instead? Hello and welcome. Welcome everybody to uh, this session with Jennifer. Jennifer was looking for a co-presenter link and she couldn't find it. So she didn't know how to come in, but it's okay. You don't have to use it. Uh, you can come in, come in with the link. Okay. So I'm just telling you how to come in. So if you could add in the chat box where you're from for now, as we go, and uh, let me see if I can help uh, get things going here uh, to um, Jennifer's session. I love technology because it makes us so vulnerable. And s vulnerability is such a human characteristic. It just makes us so human to uh, and, and not to be perfect. And, and I think that's, that's what's wonderful about technology. It unites us as people, not as machines, as many people think. They think they're going to turn into a machine if they use technology. On the contrary. All right, so a little bit for those of you that are uh, just starting this day, this first day of the fifth annual Connecting Online for 2014. And I'm so excited because there's so much learning. Just give me a hands up if you are learning, if you've been to other sessions and you're learning. Okay, thumbs up. If you're not learning, thumbs down. You know, you can always, uh, well, you have to be honest, right? So, uh, <laughs> okay, for those of you who have just started, our presenters are from around the globe. And that's what's so enriching that we're touching and we're being touched by educators from around the globe. Of course, this is, uh, thank you, Yoon, for putting two thumbs up. I didn't ask you to put as many as you feel, but you could put thousands of them, I guess, in the chat that um, we could be connecting with educators from around the world who care. All the presenters are volunteering their time because they want to make a difference. They want to bring what they have and share. I think it's not so much about themselves, but about sharing with others. Okay, and that's why the theme of this year's uh, co 14 is collaborative learning. As you can see, the, the presenters are from around the globe. We've got Australia, South Africa, South America, Asia, Europe. Okay, those are not the countries. Those are the continents, Australia. Um, we don't have New Zealand, but we've got all just about all the continents. Okay, so that's, I think, really exciting. So let's get started. I think our presenter is here. Let me just check to make sure because uh, she couldn't come in. Oh, there she is. Uh, sorry about the co-presenter. It's something new on WizIQ that I think is really wonderful. Um, I just missed you again. Could you, if it's possible, could you just um, uh, raise your hand or I'll just uh, go through. Luckily, there aren't 500 people or I would certainly uh, not be able to uh, do this. But there's Jennifer. I see you. Wonderful. So I'm going to pass on your webcam and the writing tool so you can uh, manage your own slides or if that's not possible I can do that or oh, we've got WizIQ support with us too who's helping out and um, I want to thank the hello Jennifer good to see you it's been a year I think and 
Hello. I do miss you. I'm sorry. Hello. Yes, it has been. Are you hearing me okay? <laughs> yes. Do you have a cold or what? I miss you too. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Good. <laughs> I'm glad you can see me. That's good. All right. So I'm going to mute my mic and let you get started. Uh, sorry. There's your, um, okay, if you need me. We've Excellent. Got, we've got support and everybody. My I'm sorry. first slide. Yeah, isn't it beautiful? Oh, I mean, this, okay, I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. Let everybody experience it. So thank you. I'm mute my mic. Excellent. Thank you so much, Nellie. I really appreciate the opportunity to come share some ideas with you guys today. Um, I want to apologize in advance that I look a little bit uh, tired. Um, I have been struggling with a cold all week, and I'm not entirely sure how my voice is going to uh, hold up, but we will find out, <laughs> and uh, hopefully it'll all work well. Um, I'm thrilled to be here and part of this session today. Um, I'm really looking forward to sharing a few of the ideas um, that have come up in the course of my own career when it comes to um, fostering global citizenship in the English classroom. Uh, it's my opinion, actually, that one of the most uh, powerful places, actually, that we can do this kind of work is inside the classroom. Um, when it comes to exploring global perspectives and trying to take on a little bit of an understanding of someone else's world, uh, literature has always a, a, a offered us a way into that inner world of the individual. Um, and of course, when I say English classroom, of course, I'm speaking as someone from the United States who um, has uh, video, I'm sorry, who has uh, literature from all over the English speaking world. But honestly, I think the lessons that I want to share with you today are uh, lessons that can be true in any setting. Um, and what I'm really talking about is not language, the English language, but the use of meaningful literature that, in whatever language it may be, uh, that helps students to understand the world in a new way. Um, and yes, of course, obviously, we all come to class with a cold. It's so true. I, I've been very lucky on a certain level not to have too much trouble with that. Um, Nellie, can you remind me how to change slides on this? Um, it's, it's, uh, for some on reason, the right, I'm not seeing. You should be able to see the uh, oh, next, right. like this little arrow, just, just on the top right of your uh, beautiful slide, amazing slide. Just be the eye, um, the eyebrow, the right of the... Left, right eyebrow. <laughs> I see a little plus sign. Uh, plus. No, I'm not no, seeing an arrow. No, I apologize. Lower. I'll do it for you. I won't bother you. I mean, you're not feeling well. Yeah, if you don't mind, I'm so no, I'm sorry. Fine. That's okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, so as I said, I think literature is one of the ways. You know, in, in my own classroom, I always talked about literature as as really what the world is made up of. And I'm not trying to knock science, of course. I, I believe that the world is, of course, made up of atoms in a scientific sense. Um, but I love how Rook Eiser puts it here that really um, we're talking about um, Sorry, we're talking about uh, the world ma being made up more of stories than of anything else, and that this is actually um, the the you know that that engrossing our students in story stories and helping them to see this uh, is a, a very powerful experience for them. If you'll go to the next slide, please. Sorry about this, Nellie. I'm still not seeing the click. So I'm not going to share the actual videos today, but I want to point out that all of the videos that I'm referencing are linked on the slides. Um, it should be possible for you to access all of these. Um, this first one, um, I'm hoping that many of you have heard of this incredible TED Talk by Chimamanda Adichie. Um, uh, she is a Nigerian storyteller, um, and she gave an extraordinary TED Talk on the topic of um, the danger of a single story, as she describes it. And she talks at the beginning about the fact that she uh, grew up in Africa with a very singular vision of the world, which was brought to her by British literature. And it wasn't until she was quite a bit older that she realized that there was such thing as African literature, um, that there were ways and opportunities for people to um, uh, explore the world in a very African way. And she discovered Nigerian writers um, like, um, uh, uh, well, all sorts of people, sorry, the names in my mind right now. Um, she discovered all these African writers and discovered that her characters could actually be like her and look like her, and that this was, in fact, a, a valid way of thinking about um, 
about the uh, about the classroom, about the story, um, that her own world mattered just as much uh, as anybody else's world within the world of literature. And I think this brings to, to mind a very, very important thing to think about in our own classrooms, that it's very easy to get lockstepped into a lot of the same kind of literature over and over um, without realizing or without recognizing, perhaps, that we are transmitting a message to our kids about um, what, what stories matter and which characters are important, um, and that it's really incredibly important that we actually make room in our classrooms for their stories to matter as well. If you can go to the next slide, please. Sorry, I'm going to have to do this the whole way through, I guess. I'm still not seeing those arrows you were talking about, Nelly. Thank you. I appreciate that. As I said at the beginning, I, I'm a strong believer that the English classroom is one of the few places in the schoolhouse, or the literature classroom, I should say, is the only place in the schoolhouse where almost anything can be brought up. Um, and be considered on topic. Uh, I think in most classrooms, the te and this is by no fault of the teachers or anyone else involved, um, but I think for a lot of teachers, uh, the reality is not the same, uh, that we feel as though there are certain limits or boundaries to what we can talk about, whether be based usually on whether or not we feel like they are relevant to our own um, uh, disciplines uh, or effectively enough relevant. Um, and the reality, I think, in my opinion at least, is that in the English classroom, everything is relevant. And that means that we can bring up just about anything. And that means also that we have a responsibility as well as an opportunity to really show people, to show our students some perspectives that they wouldn't have seen otherwise. If you'll go to the next slide, please. So I love the words of Alvin Toffler, who points out to us that liter literacy is not what we mean by connecting with the world, and that education in the 21st century is not just about literacy. Now, I don't think his point is to denigrate the importance of literacy either, but to recognize that the, the illiterate of the 21st century are not going to be those who can't read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. And I think if we think of our, our classrooms as places where students have an opportunity to learn learn, unlearn, and relearn through reading, through literature, through writing, um, that we can turn our, our classrooms into a much more powerful space uh, for interaction. Next slide, please. So I think there are a few key elements to the way we um, ideally should be at approaching this kind of learning. Um, first of all, I would say I think it's really important that within the, the uh, classroom that we're providing opportunities for students to create knowledge and not just consume information. Too much of the time they're being asked basically just to, our students are being asked basically to spit back information, um, to uh, you know, to take in and, and spit back um, kind of the Paulo Freire, um, the model that Paulo Freire refers to as banking education, um, which is not ideal, where the teacher knows everything, banks it into the brains of the children, and the children spit it back to us as we ask it of them um, on, their, uh, on their tests and that kind of thing. I think particularly in the English uh, classroom or the literature classroom, we have an opportunity to do a great deal more because we work in an environment where um, creativity is valued, or it can be valued, um, and it should be valued, in my opinion, and that we should be creating opportunities for kids to write and create for themselves as well. Slide. Nelly, next slide. Please. Thanks. Um, so a couple of the things I think, another thing that I think we really need to make sure we're trying to pay attention to is to help students to auth uh, navigate authentic complexity. I know that at least in the United States we live in a culture where very much of the time, and, and way too much of the time in my opinion, we are um, uh, avoiding complexity, meaning we avoid the really tricky conversations. So when race comes up, when intercultural conflict comes up, um, at least within U.S. society, I would personally say that we tend to race for the closet and disappear and try to avoid the conversation. We live in a culture of comfort. And I'm guessing that many of you live in cir very similar circumstances, whether in your own uh, larger society or within the culture of your school, um, that it's hard often in a lot of environments to talk about difficult issues. Um, I think in the English classroom we have an opportunity as well as a responsibility to not only engage with complexity but to help students figure out how to navigate it, how to lean into their discomfort when they feel it, and how to ask good questions so that they don't stay stuck in a place of discomfort. Next slide, please. 
I'm still searching here, Melly, across the top to try to figure out. Oops, go back one. Um, I'm still searching across the top here for uh, how to change them myself. I'm not sure why I can't. Can you go back? Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Um, I also think, though, too, that it, it's our responsibility to think very carefully about what sorts of layers of human experience are appropriate to share with different age groups. So I do think it's it's very appropriate to keep a, a very close eye on what feels right um, for our different age groups. I certainly think, for example, that reading a, a piece of literature that really explores war in a deep, deep way wouldn't be appropriate with a kindergarten student. But I also know that kindergartners are capable of much more dialogue about human conflict than we often give them credit for, honestly. So I think that um, I think in a lot of ways, it's not that we should avoid those deeper layers, it's that we should be thoughtful about which layers we can reveal at different age groups and, and peel those layers back very carefully like an onion or, as with my image here, like a Russian doll, pulling back the outer layers to reveal something deeper as kids get older and are ready for it. Next slide, please. I'm so sorry to do this to you, Nellie. <laughs> I'm still searching for the right button and I don't think I have it. That's okay. It's probably because I came in as a non I think it's because I came in as a non as a non presenter originally. Could be. If you could move it to the next one, please. Sure. Thank you. Um, this actually this statement comes from a student survey that was done at a youth summit in um, in Wisconsin last February, where students were asked to identify several things that they felt that a global classroom should provide them. And this is uh, this was how one of their answers. It's one of several answers they offered. Um, it's just one of my favorites. Said that they felt that the global classroom should foster open mindedness and promote awareness and acceptance. And this is something we can do very easily through literature because literature automatically creates a sense of empathy, a, cr a sense of connection to the main characters, um, and therefore creates an emotional connection which allows us to really understand and, uh, the lives of others and um, the Native Americans saying in the United States, at least North American Natives, is uh, to walk a mile in someone else's moccasins. And this is a really good example of, of uh, literature can do that. I also want to point out that they have not used the word tolerance. And I think that's particularly marked because a lot of teachers, at least in the United States, are still focused a bit more than I would personally on just teaching tolerance. And this is not meant to be a criticism of the teaching tolerance movement. I think we have created incredible progress um, through uh, um, approaches like teaching tolerance. I think that was a really, really important step. And I think any of you who have not explored the teaching tolerance movement, I certainly encourage you to take a look at their resources. They're doing great work. But I would also say that I think the word tolerance suggests a very low standard that we're reaching for. Um, and that a world filled with people who only tolerate each other doesn't sound very much like a world that I actually want to live in. Because that word suggests that we actually hate each other and walk around pretending that we don't. And I think that that's part of why we so often uh, discover that it's so, so hard for us to reach a deeper level of dialogue um, in our classrooms because it is so hard to move beyond just just tolerance to something that's much deeper. Um, so I would, I would personally say I think the way these kids put it is beautiful, that we should be trying to promote open-mindedness, awareness, and acceptance. And this doesn't mean that we're not thinking critically about things, cultural practices, practices that we might question. We certainly still do want to teach kids to think critically, but to do so in a non-judgmental way that still tries to understand um, and become aware of and accept perhaps the, the cultural origins of practices that we don't um, agree with. Next slide, please. piece of it is the reading choices we make. And I want to make sure it's very clear to everyone here, I don't think that you have to revamp your entire curriculum to do this kind of work at all. And in fact, I think you can make small changes to the way that you teach and the things that you teach that will bring new voices and stories into the classroom. As Chimamanda Adichie points out, when we only provide a singular or a few singular storylines, um, we do run the risk of students thinking that the world is made up just of those storylines. So the idea of bringing in other voices I think is important and that might mean other pieces of literature you know it might mean looking for some global literature that you could weave into your course or it could very simply mean looking for other types of examples of literature from within your own country um, it could also mean bringing literally bringing pardon me, other youth voices into your classrooms um, through technologies, through networks and existing platforms that allow your students to explore the writing and artwork and creativity of other young people. 
people in the world, not just published and famous authors. Next slide, please. I think it's important, too, to keep in mind that we don't want to lost it in translation. I know a lot of teachers in the United States and, and North America in general who actually will tend to avoid um, working with uh, pieces of literature that have been translated from other languages into English because they are very concerned about all the things that could be wrong <laughs> with those pieces of literature and that could be wrong with a, uh, uh, with a given translation. And my feeling is that that's an incredible opportunity lost, which is a real shame, uh, meaning that I think we actually should be exploring the translations and, and helping students to notice, for example, how a given translation changes or, or manages to convey what exercise in my class, which was recommended to me by a wonderful educator, Honor Mormon, um, U.S. educator, uh, which was to take one poem by Gabriel the Chilean was a Chilean poet, wonderful, wonderful poet, Nobel Prize winner. Um, took one poem by Gabriela Mistral and then looked at two to three different translations of the poem in my class. And mind you, not all of my students were Spanish speaking or Spanish studying, so not everybody understood the Spanish, but everyone had enough language background to be able to notice what the authors, what the translators had done differently in how they had tried to convey either her literal meaning or the feeling and emotional intent of her work. And as a result, it was a really very... Um, uh, very powerful uh, experience for the kids. Rather than avoiding translation, they suddenly realized that the translators' decisions made all the difference in how, the, and that was very much what I was hoping um, the, the lesson would be. So that's an exercise you might try that would help to avoid, um, to, I, I'm sorry, to engage in translation rather than avoid it. Next slide, please. Um, you know, one of the tactics that I used also in terms of writing practice was that I found I could bring tons of different global perspectives and global issues up in my classroom, whether or not they were relevant to the literature, in fact, by using editorial cartoons. So I wanted to share this particular um, uh, st strategy with you because I think it's actually, it was pretty surprising to me how easily it worked with students. Um, I used this approach with ninth grade, with ninth graders and, and tenth grade. And what I would do is I would call through the Pulitzer Prize winning um, editorial cartoons or I would take a look in the uh, daily newspaper to find some recent ones or in magazines, whatever it might be, uh, to find different editorial cartoons and I would throw them up. Um, and yeah, exactly, Louise, as, uh, Louis, sorry, as you're pointing out, it's a great way to get this conversation started about lots of different kinds of topics. What I found was that I could do introduction paragraph practice really easily with these. What I would ask my students to do is to identify what they felt was the artist's um, what they felt was the artist's uh, uh, thesis in the piece in the piece of uh, cartoon. Sorry, um, and then. How could they tell that that was the artist's thesis? What were the elements of the picture that showed them that? So I was giving them very practical practice, really, when you think about it, in what they were going to be doing anyway, which was writing introduction paragraphs and writing essays and things like that. But by using a wide array of different types of editorial cartoons, I was able to dig into some pretty good topics, and obviously some very controversial ones, and often some very current ones that, that um, resonated for the students as well. Next slide, please. Next slide, please, Nellie. Oh, thank you. Um, so I wanted to share a little bit, too, about driving questions. I think a great deal of what does or doesn't work, honestly, um, in a given uh, class for leading to deep deep conversations about literature is usually connected to the kinds of questions we're using to frame a given experience for kids. I have a great deal of training in particular with project-based learning and we we refer to these as driving questions. Um, so uh, a driving question would be, it's, it's a little bit like a thesis, right? Or the answer would be a bit like a thesis. But a really strong driving question for kids does not 
have just one answer. It has many different answers. It's a word, it's a question that if they were to put it in Google, they would get thousands of possible answers or no answers at all, which means that it's going to force them to think for themselves about the given topic. Now, that first one is, you know, relatively straightforward, but the second one here, um, thank you, that was good timing, Nelly. Um, what I'm showing here in the second version is a slightly deeper, slightly meatier um, way of thinking about the Dubliners. What can we learn about the world by exploring which elements of James Joyce's Dublin still exist in modern day and which do not? Working with an, a question like this allows me not only to engage my students in the literature and the sense of history, but it also allows me an opportunity to make literature relevant in the current day um, and in the current um, opportunities, uh, the current Ireland. And this creates an opportunity, for example, for students to, let's say, uh, talk to young people in Ireland uh, who are also reading the Dubliners and get them to help us understand what is and isn't still true of Dublin today as compared to Dublin in, in uh, Joyce's time. Next one, please. Nelly, next slide. Thank you. Um, I taught Lord of the Flies for years, and I do think it's a powerful allegory on the human experience, certainly. And that's a question that's, this kind of driving question is asked in a lot of English classes. It's not a bad question, but if we can go to the next slide, let me show you what happens when we deepen the experience a little bit. Oops, one back, please. Sorry. I need that. Yeah, that. Perfect, thank you. No, the one with the new text. Oh, shoot. There you go. That's where I need to be. Thank you. Um, so what you'll notice in this driving question is that I'm actually giving students a role. I'm asking them to think like sociologists and to use literature as a way to understand something about human nature and then apply it to a different conflict in the modern day. And that could really be any conflict. In other words, what can we learn from about human nature from this which would actually allow us to solve some sort of a modern day conflict in the world? Now we're applying literature in a slightly different way. It doesn't take away the question of the allegory on human experience, it, what it does in, instead is it actually deepens the, the question of that allegory um, and it allows us to do something even deeper. Next one. Thank you. Uh, shoot, I need to go back one, one at a time, thank you. Um, so this one, why is Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet an important piece of literature? An interesting question. I actually personally really struggled with teaching Romeo and Juliet because I didn't feel it was one of Shakespeare's best. Um, and I, you know, students certainly responded to the, um, with, uh, I'm sorry, uh, students responded well to the love story elements of it, but I was always really distressed by how fatalistic, it, honestly, it was, and the fact that the characters do all die. And um, and this image, actually, thank you for uh, pointing that out, Tom. This is a great, great image that comes from a project which could easily be recreated in classrooms. Um, this was the Recovered Books Project, and the idea was that um, peop uh, artists all over the world were asked to reinvent the covers for classic people pieces of literature and this particular one was a winner um, by Christopher Porter um, love is toxic being his slogan there um, I think this would actually make a really cool project in almost any classroom literature classroom take this piece that we're of literature we're reading and invent a new cover for it that conveys something of the story that you think is powerful but let's notice now let's go ahead and go to the next slide please and let's notice how um, the intent of the exploration changes the moment that we change the question a little bit. Nellie, if you could that next one, please. Still Romeo and Juliet, but the next slide. <sighs> Nellie? It's not um, playing around support. with support. Yeah. Whoever's doing it. Yeah, oh. yeah, right. Uh, support, <laughs> could you please hurry up because I got other things to do right now. Thanks. Oh, this is terrible, Nellie. I don't know why I don't have control. I don't see any of the errors you were talking about. Thank you very much. All right, so now we have, as young writers, how might we reimagine William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet in the context of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or the uh, or South African apartheid? Or honestly, you could choose just about any um, uh, example in the world. It works with Rwanda. It works with all sorts of different places where what you have is basically 
people who are related to each other in a basic and deep way, but who then go to war with each other, um, and whether that's related in the sense of geography or the sense of genetics, um, honestly doesn't matter. But what we're doing then is we're asking students to think like young writers and to really place themselves in, uh, to reimagine the story. And it's part of why Shakespeare's work has endured is because it can so easily be recreated for different settings, um, and yet we still so often teach it in its own, only in its historical setting. And I think that hurts the extent to which kids really get the point and really get a deep experience out of Shakespeare. And I think it also um, loses, a, we lose an opportunity along the way to help them learn something about the current world as well. Next slide, please. Thank you. So this, uh, this statement comes from Senator Fulbright, who um, was the founder of, of all of the incredible Fulbright opportunities out there in the world for teacher exchange, um, as well as student exchange. Um, and he said that educational exchange can turn nations into people, contributing as no other form of communication can to the humanizing of international relations. In my opinion, this is a really powerful statement. And I think what's particularly important here is that word humanizing. I think the main literature does, which many other classrooms don't, honestly, is to humanize the world, to give students a sense of real human beings, real people um, around the world. And honestly, I think this is, I mean, I know that we're in the classroom to help them learn to read and to write well and to develop deep skills in those areas. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that that's not true, but I think along the way, our most important responsibility is actually not that. It's not the reading and writing. Our most important responsibility is to help kids see the world as peopled by human beings, other people, other human beings um, who have needs and wants just like we do. And part of why I say this is because I'm increasingly convinced that we don't drop bombs, for example, on people who we see as full human beings. Um, and we don't make choices, political choices or otherwise, that hurt people who we really see as full and complete human beings who have the same right to thrive that we do. So I'm um, increasingly convinced that the English classroom can allow us to do that and that it's a good thing for kids to realize that. I think we, the more we see others as humans, the more what we want to do is respond authentically and help to find, um, help people to make connections and to, um, and to really effectively um, you know, connect with other people in the world and see them as human beings. And I think it, it really makes a huge difference, in my opinion, to give kids that space to really develop and foster that sense of others as, as full humans um, whose needs and wants matter just as much as our own. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, now, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm not going to be showing the films today as we go, um, but uh, I have linked quite a few films to the slides. I really encourage you to go through the slides later and take a look at these various uh, videos as you have time. Um, this is one that I used very successfully in the classroom, and it's a TED Talk um, from the Denver area, actually, by a photographer named Aaron Huey. And in this piece, he talks about the Lakota Nation um, and his own experiences within that nation. This is a native of American tribe that has been um, very consistently uh, separated from others, um, put on reservations, their land has been reduced over and over and over again, um, and in fact their, their region of the country is still often to as a prisoner of war camp um, rather than community or even the, the very negative term reservation. Um, and Aaron Huey has spent a great deal of time among the Lakota. Um, and this film is just, I mean, it's an incredible talk. Uh, he shares many photographs, much like this one, which I think is a really provocative image to get kids thinking about how could somebody be considered a hero who kills cowboys and why within the context of Native of American history, does that actually make sense, right? Why would it be that, that, that someone who kills a cowboy would be seen as a hero rather than the cowboy himself? This is a really important kid to flip the way they think about the big values, like um, who they would consider a hero, um, and can really get them thinking differently. Again, I'm not trying to suggest that we want them to see the cowboys as 
it's 100% evil either. That's certainly not the purpose of this kind of work, but that they realize that cowboys or any given people could be seen differently by someone who felt oppressed by them. Um, he also uses a metaphor, incredible metaphor in the film, where he talks about how the, the Lakota people respond to him as a, as a white man. And he talks about the fact that they refer to him by a word which means foreigner, but which literally means he who takes the best meat. And he talks very deeply about the fact that he, he, this word, the, the fact that he's called by this word, always reminds him of the fact that he does take the best meat. He has been raised in a privileged system, raised as, as a member of a more privileged race. Um, and he is seen still as someone who takes the best meat. And this, I think, by itself could be a really powerful conversation to have with kids. Um, and that question of, you know, have we been those meat and what does that mean or have we those who have not gotten the best meat and what does that mean um, for those who have of course it's not about guilt it's about you know what's the sense of responsibility that comes from realizing that you have more than others do next slide. excuse me for sometimes the connection gets a bit slow can you um, disable your webcam? Next slide, please. The webcam. Report. Could you um, mute your webcam? Do you know how? Thank you. Pillar picture. Um, we can see that there. OK, I'm still here. I think we're all right. Um, in this particular picture, you can see uh, three Palestinian poets. Actually, this is this photo was shot at Anaja National University in the West Bank, and you can see the three poets sitting at the table: two students and one teacher. Um, and on the screen behind them, and they're looking at a, another screen with the same young woman um, up at the front there. Um, but you can see that behind them there is a, a a video screen with a young woman who is connecting from Denver, Colorado. So this. This is actually a video conference um, schools in, um, in various places. And what we found was that connecting kids through poetry, through writing, through art, through photography, was a way to get them engaged in pretty deep conversations and political discussions without, um, uh, without creating so much friction that they couldn't hear each other's perspectives. Can we go to the next slide, please? I think it's also important, though, too, I've talked a lot about um, conflict. I've talked a lot about the negative end of things. I think it's really important, too, that we use literature as a way to foster optimism, to promote that sense of connectedness with others in the world. And um, I found that photographic prompts were a wonderful and easy way uh, to do this, um, to get kids uh, exploring photographs from places all over the world. Um, there are tons and tons of... Um, uh, organizations out there, newspapers particularly, or news sources, journalism uh, sources, where they will post, you know, the photos of the week, or the photos of the month, or the photos of the day. Um, they're all over, from all over the world, and they can really be an incredible tool for getting kids thinking about different perspectives. And I use them personally as writing prompts, where, and I would actually let my students choose images for themselves. I would direct them perhaps to a particular site or collection, have them choose an image that really resonated for them and then um, do some sort of a piece of writing about or in response to the image they chose. Next one, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, the other piece of this, I think, personally, is that we want kids, I, I at least want my students to connect with that sense that we that we have a, a wide array of perspectives in the world, but that that actually doesn't mean that we don't still share a common sense of beauty and a common sense of humanity. This image from National Geographic is one that I used with students. And I think that the National Geographic, yes, this is a real photograph, um, and I think the images from National Geographic are just incredible. Um, they always have extraordinary pictures online that you don't have to be a member to access. And they can really help kids connect with that sense of the fact that all over the world we find very similar things beautiful and meaningful and powerful and that that means that we have something similar you know that we all have that genetic code that 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 has a sense of aesthetics um, and that that connects us next slide please
Thank you. Um, connected to that is act that we have similar pursuits and passions. Um, we share a planet, of course, um, and so I think that's another piece of it for me, at least, is to help kids through literature, through writing, through photography, through all these different kinds of artistic pursuits and elements to really um, celebrate the fact that we have these common common passions. That, for example, humans throughout history and all over the planet have been drawn to water and have tried to find ways to to use it to navigate, but also also to, um, to sort of um, overcome it or control it and feel like we can ride it, um, and that this is a very human tendency. Next slide, please. Um, another piece of it, too, I think, is connecting kids through technology um, with the world. So I want to mention one particular platform. I've done a lot of uh, direct work with Taking It Global, and this is an, a really extraordinary online platform. They have a lot of students' artistic work from all over the world. So as I mentioned earlier, I think it can be a really great way uh, to um, uh, for students to to connect with uh, young people around the world, to find art by young people in different parts of the world and maybe write about it. Um, they can post their own writing. They can get involved in actions, uh, make commitments to making changes in their behavior or educating other people. Um, so the whole platform is, is developed around this idea of inspiring, informing, and involving kids in global change. And I think it's a great way to do it. Now, they're not the only platform out there. There are many incredible, incredible organizations doing good work, um, but this was one of the ones I used for my own English classroom, and I found it to be a very powerful tool for kids, and they really read a lot. Next slide, Next slide please. Thank you. Uh, this comes from uh, one of my favorite pieces of work by the author uh, Vladimir Nabokov, Russian author who uh, spent a lot of his life in Europe as well as in the United States, later life. Um, and I used to read this piece with my students because I found it so important. You know, we work in a world of, of we live in a world of common sense, where common sense rules. And yet, as Vladimir Nabokov points out, common sense has trampled down many a gentle genius whose eyes had delighted in a too early moonbeam of some too early truth. Common sense at its first is sense made common, and so everything is comfortably cheapened by its touch. Common sense is square, whereas all the most essential visions and values of life are beautifully round, as round as the universe or the eyes of a child at its first circus show. And I share this quotation to, to try to point out that I, I really think we want to make sure that our classrooms are places where, yes, they understand what common sense is, but we also make room for that gentle genius, right? That we make room for the creative vision, for the kid who sees something completely different from something at somebody else, um, and who has a vision that is different from those of others around them. Um, because I think that that's where innovation comes from. That, that kid that, um, you know, that gentle genius um, that Nabokov describes here really is the kid who, who you know, has the potential to create change, who is seeing something different and has something to offer the world because of that different value or that different vision. And too often, I think our schools, unfortunately, keep them from developing that vision um, and instead ask them to just read and write and do things in a very mechanical way um, that often will kill that creativity and that sense of the, the round view of the world. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, I, th I think this is an important uh, idea as well. Uh, Tony Wagner, in his book Creating Innovators, points out that innovators are imbued with a, with a purpose, a style of behavior and attitude that allows them to create something original of value to make a difference or change a process system, sorry, service system or way of thinking. Now, if we're fostering this, both in our classrooms and in the broader sense, if we're fostering this sense of, you know, it's, it's good to be an innovator. We have room in our community for innovators. This is something we value in our schools. Um, then we do need to be prepared for some really interesting creative things to happen in our schoolhouses as well. Let's go to the next slide and I'll show you what I mean. 
So I worked with a student, and this is one of many students I worked with who had this same kind of creative tendency. She was um, a student who often, I think, felt sort of boxed into the classroom, honestly. And I don't think she always felt as though the classroom allowed her to, to fully be herself. And when we started working in poetry, and I started sharing these ideas that common sense was not necessarily what we were shooting for, that her own creative ideas really did matter, she started doing some really innovative things. Um, one of her projects was this photography project. If we can go on to the next slide as well, so you can see the second image. She combined her love of photography with her love of poetry, um, wrote uh, lines of poetry on her friends and photographed them um, and created a, a, quite a stir on campus actually because uh, there were girls walking around all day covered in poetry um, and I was really proud of her. It caused a little bit of a stir. Um, not everybody responded to it as positively as I did, um, but I think that's it's the first step to creating an environment across the schoolhouse where this kind of thinking is valued. Next slide, please. Um, now that particular student, when, when I asked her after the experience of exploring poetry all over the world, exploring photographs all over the world, writing um, about uh, at places other than her own home, and then also getting to connect live with poets from different parts of the world, she said that she said seeing two worlds come together because of poetry and writing opened my eyes to the beauty of diversity and the importance of communication. My writing has become less about me and more about the world around me. I've learned that writing is a testament to the events and people we encounter. So I just have to emphasize this. This was a 17-year-old girl saying, my writing has become less about me and more about the world around me. I have never had a better compliment, a higher or deeper compliment from a student than that one line that she um, ref uh, of reflection that Frankie shared, um, that I had managed to, to shift her out of thinking about herself first and had ended that sort of cultural nearsightedness and now had her thinking in a much, much broader way about the stories of the world. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, I did want to uh, share that a colleague and I are working on developing a workshop for students as well as an accompanying professional development workshop for teachers specifically on the kinds of things that I've been talking about today. Um, the driving question of the workshop for students is how do we use our creative voice to illuminate human the human experience and how can our writing facilitate global agency. And this is a, um, uh, you can find out more about this particular workshop at principallearning.org which is my website. That's also where you You'll find my blog and all sorts of other materials that I post, uh, recordings, of course, from this session and other sessions I've done um, for the Connecting Online conference are there as well. But this is a, a workshop that we would love to bring into schools, and our thought is to do a day-long workshop with students. I'm sorry, to do, first of all, maybe a two-hour in-service with, with teachers the day before, and then to run a workshop, a day-long workshop with students um, on the following day. It could be organized any a, a variety of different ways, but the idea is to do some intensive work with kids that creates an inclusive, um, inspiring, and connected uh, workshop for kids. Next slide, please. So this is the only poem I'm actually going to read for you guys in its entirety because for me this has become a really, it's just it increasingly becomes this very, very important poem uh, when it comes to helping kids see the world in a different way. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess the engine block image, Tom, is maybe a slightly questionable image, but we were thinking about the mechanics, <laughs> right? Uh, the mechanics behind the work. Um, and the woman who put together the uh, the uh, promotional materials for me, her, her husband actually has a hobby of photographing uh, mechanical um, pieces, engines, things like that. He loves old um, engine blocks and stuff like that, so kind of cool. Um, all right, so, so this is a poem called Wandering Around an Albuquerque Airport Terminal, and it's by the Palestinian-American poet Naomi Shihab Nye. I'm going to share it with you uh, in its entirety because I think it's such a, an incredible poem uh, for thinking about the, the world that we hope to create um, and for helping to inspire kids to be part of creating that world. After learning my flight was detained four hours, I heard the announcement. If anyone in the vicinity of gate 4A understands any Arabic, please come to the gate immediately. Well, one pauses these days. Gate 4A was my own gate. I went there. 
An older woman in full pa traditional Palestinian dress, just like my grandma wore, was crumpled to the floor, wailing loudly. Help, said the flight service person. Talk to her. What is her problem? We told her the flight was going to be four hours late, and she did this. I put my arm around her and spoke to her haltingly. Shudoa, shubidu kabibti, stani stani shwe min fadlik, shubitsui. The minute she heard any words she knew, however poorly used, she stopped crying. She thought our flight had been canceled entirely. She needed to be in El Paso for some major medical treatment the following day. I said, no, no, we're fine. You'll get there, just late. Who's picking you up? Let's call him and tell him. We called her son, and I spoke with him in English. I told him I would stay next to her. His I would stay with his mother till we got on the plane, and would ride next to her, Southwest. She talked to him. Then we called her other sons just for the fun of it. Then we called my dad, and he and she spoke for a while in Arabic, and found out, of course, they had ten shared friends. Then I thought, just for the heck of it, why not call some Palestinian poets I know and let them chat with her? This all took up about two hours. She was laughing a lot by then, telling about her life, answering questions. She had pulled a sack of homemade mamul cookies, little powdered sugar crumbly mounds stuffed with dates and nuts, out of her bag and was offering them to all of the women at the gate. To, uh, to my amazement, not a single woman declined one. It was like a sacrament. The traveler from Argentina, the traveler from California, the lovely woman from Laredo, they were all covered with the same powdered sugar and smiling. There are no better cookies. And then the airline broke out the free beverages from huge coolers, non-alcoholic, and the two little girls for our flight, one African-American, one uh, Mexican-American, ran around serving us all apple juice and lemonade, and they were covered with powdered sugar, too. And I noticed my new best friend, by now we were holding hands, had a potted po plant poking out of her bag, some medicinal thing with green furry leaves, such an old country traveling tradition. Always carry a plant. Always stay rooted to somewhere. And I looked around that gate of late and weary ones and thought, this is the world I want to live in, the shared world. A single person in this gate, once the crying of confusion stopped, has seemed apprehensive about any other person. They took the cookies. I wanted to hug all those other women too. This can still happen every, anywhere. Not everything is lost. If we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Huh, such a powerful poem. I'm glad you liked it. I, I think it's, a, I, I almost never know what quite what to say after it, actually, but I know that in sharing it with students, they all got that sense of that shared world that might, we might work together to create, um, that we already have, honestly, but that we could work together to make better. So I want to end with some, some great images and a little bit of a challenge to the rest of you. Um, these actually, these hand images come from a, a collection of images that were put together um, called 22 Words, and it's writing advice from writers. Um, and the idea was that they asked um, several dozen uh, writers, or maybe it was a broad call, I'm not sure, um, to share some advice for students about, or for young writers, and to do so on their hands. Um, and so this is the first one. A little bit. I'll let you explore the image for a moment. All right. All right. Go, go ahead and go to the second one, if you would, please. Next slide. Thank you. This one comes from Jody Lid Nye. I found these incredibly powerful. Good, I'm glad you're having the same reaction. I hope you have the same reaction to the next one. Let's go ahead and move to the next one, please. <laughs> so this is ultimately the thesis of my show, and honestly, the thesis of the work with kids as well, <laughs> in a lot of ways, um, that, that a lot of this is about connecting 
and feeling that emotional sense, but a lot of it too is about getting to that point where we just sit down and make it happen, and we do the writing, and we make it work. Um, and I think, you know, within the literature classroom, we have more sense of the value behind the sitting your butt down and writing um, that Patrick Rufus uh, shares here um, than anybody else does. Um, so getting kids excited, getting them excited about the way that they're writing can help to share their voice and their view with the world. And what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to ask each of you, um, whether you do it right now or whether you do it after we finish this presentation, to grab a pen, ideally a permanent pen, and write something down on your own hand, That's um, uh, whether it's a line of poetry, a piece of advice, an affirmation of something that you have been meaning to do and wanting to do, a piece of writing that you've been dying to get to, a piece of reading that you've always wanted to incorporate into your class, whatever it may be, I really encourage you to follow this presentation or even right now to grab that pen. When I do these live in person, I actually pass around pens and I get people to do it on the spot. Um, and, uh, and yes, absolutely, the links are on all of the slides, Natalie, so when you see the slides later, you are welcome to grab um, all of the different um, pieces are linked on the slides themselves, so you should be able to find them easily. Um, I really encourage you to take this opportunity. I know that we're busy people as teachers, and it's really hard to make room for our own growth as well. Um, but I encourage you to maybe come up with one that's about you as a writer, a thinker, and a person, and maybe one that is for about what you want to change in your practice with your students in order to find new ways to bring global perspectives um, and the, the importance of those perspectives into other classrooms. Let's go ahead and move to the next slide, please. And yeah, these, all of the slides, I believe, are already available for download. Can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, as a closing, I want to share these words from Eric Hoffer, who is a, um, a science fiction writer. He says that in times of change, learners inherit the earth, while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. I think in a lot of ways, we are here right now thinking of ourselves as learners rather than the learned. And I think one of the most important things we can convey to our kids, to our students, is this idea that at no point are we ever learned, because that suggests that the process has ended, and that through literature and through our experiences of engaging with the world, that we are actually lifelong learners, that we are always growing and changing, and always finding new ways to re-envision ourselves and the way we interact with others in the world. If you'll go to the next slide, please. Next slide, please. Sorry about these delays, folks. Um, I'm not going to show this film, but I really this I hope that this is actually the first thing you'll watch right after I finish. Um, you can even find this if you have not downloaded the slides and stuff. You can actually go into uh, YouTube and just search by the Lost Generation, and you will find extraordinary things. Um, but the Lost Generation was a student poem that was written uh, in response to a request for poems about the current generation. Um, and the idea was uh, they could write any poem. The, the contest was put together by the American Association of Retired Persons. I'm not going to give anything away about the poem, but ultimately this young person's thesis or point is that they are not the lost generation, that they have a great deal to offer in terms of reconstructing this very difficult world we've created for ourselves. Um, and every one of your students has the potential to be that voice of change um, as we help them to, to feel connected and to be honestly connected um, with young people around the world and the perspective of a, a wide array of different people. So if we'll go to the last slide, please. I want to thank everybody for being part of this session. I've really enjoyed having the opportunity to chat with all of you. I'm always glad to, um, to talk to people outside of these sessions. If you have questions or want access to a resource I might have mentioned and forgotten to link, um, I have a couple minutes that I can probably take a couple of questions if you'd like, but I know that Nellie keeps the timing pretty tight too. So um, I want to say thank you to all of you for um, being part of this audience. I'm sorry about the technical challenges. I don't, you know, I, for some reason I couldn't find the moderator link or the co-presenter link at the last minute. So I I, I appreciate your understanding. I hope you've gotten some good things out of this. Um, and thank you all for being part of my session today. Thank you, Jennifer. I don't know. I have never written on my... Uh...
hand and it seems that my hand is really small <laughs> i didn't realize how small my hand is <laughs> how do you get so many things on it i i mean my hand is really <laughs> I, don't tiny. Know. i don't know it's tiny <laughs> It's great. <laughs> but thank it's you. Not, maybe they maybe they use really thin. <laughs> I don't know. But th I'm going to practice. I'll practice. Uh, your your images Perfect. your images are so literary. They they they're like poems. I mean, I've never seen anything like this. I mean, I know that, thank you. that you know images are, you know, you can get so much out of images, but not like this. I've never seen anything like it. So Thank you. I hope you feel better right away. I'm sure you do already. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And I have a little recovery still to do, but I'm getting there. And, and, and to join us like this, you know, this would never happen face to face. You're not going to drag yourself to school. I mean, you wouldn't drag yourself to a conference, a physical conference in your condition. <laughs> and yet you can join us and share so much with us so thank you very very Absolutely. much and i hope you'll join us in the um in the course feed of the there's the link that tom has added uh talk about globalization and caring there's thomas from venezuela who's so caring and, and everybody else is is really uh amazing so there's the link if you could just click on that you can also copy the chat and take it with you this session was extended which i asked it not to be because i gotta go um, so we'll see you in the next session, which is going to be about copyrights. So join us. Thank you. Thank you so, Thank much. You so much, Nellie.